welcome to the third of the lectures of the video lectures of the second module um, of the course knowledge and data i have been arguing in the previous uh, two lectures that um, using data that has been published on the web is very difficult because this data is mostly still living in silos even though it is published on the web it's not possible by machines to access it and link it to their own applications and their own data and that knowledge graphs are a potential solution to this that this requires some technological advances social advantages and so forth and um, here we discuss uh, one of the major technological standards that allows this publication of uh, knowledge graphs on the web and that is the, the data model of the language rdf it's really the knowledge graph language on the web it's all based on these four principles, out of which uh, three in principle are um, based on the rdf technology as a solution um, give all things a name this is uh, something that is implemented in rdf uh, uh, which we'll discuss in a minute uh, the names and addresses on the web, so RDF is a web language, web resources that we can address and give names to and then link appropriately, which is the third element of, for which RDF is very useful. The fourth one is making explicit the meaning of things can be added to RDFs, uh, RDF with the languages RDFs that we discussed in week uh, module 3 and uh, language uh, OWL, which is a very expressive ontology language for modeling domain knowledge, which we will discuss in week four. So RDF itself will be now our means to implement the principles one to three. So this is what we are discussing now in this module. Remember what uh, um, Tim said, uh, use your eyes as names for things, use HTTP your eyes so that people can look up those names so um, then they should also get useful information in RDF, which basically means that the documents themselves that you can derive, get back using an HTTP get request, for example, is again something that you can dereference, that you can understand, that you can machine in a machine readable way, a link to other sources. And the more you link your, your RISE to, the more they can be used and discovered. And RDF is our tool for this. So RDF stands for the Resource Description Framework, RDF, and it's a standard data model for data interchange on the web. Um, it comes with different syntaxes, different ways of writing it down, and that's why it's, um, it, it's a way of representing data and therefore called a data model. It facilitates data merging, um, even if the schemas differ, because you can explicitly add schema information to each of the data units that have been uh, uh, represented in RDF. And by linking some of the web objects, the URIs, even if they live on different addresses at different locations on the web, you can really make a relationship between things, um, which is called a triple. And it allows data to be mixed, exposed and shared across different applications and therefore is really the data model for data interchangeability. Each link is a triple, which means that there is a, an object related to another object by a predicate. And if you have a set of those triples, then you get a directed label graph. And these graph views, they are often used in the visual explanation, but RDF itself is just a data model with these triples. So here's an example of these RDF triples. All information in RDF is expressed as such a triple, which are in pre predicate logic terms, two place predicates, so a predicate with two arguments. The triples consist of a subject, a predicate, and an object. And we have seen already in our knowledge graph exactly the structure that you have a subject, the Netherlands, a predicate has capitals and an object, Amsterdam. Um, Amsterdam itself, again, can then be in the subject position with the predicate linked has major to uh, Eberhard van der Laan and uh, Eberhard van der Laan can be linked to a, a certain date where he was born. Um, we often also use different words for a triple. Mostly we say triple, but it, it, sometimes it's also called an, an RDF statement or an RDF fact, because this is really where you, where you try to state the truth that you believe the truth of the world is, the facts of the world. 
And then there are three different types of things that we can use in an RDF triple, the URI references, the literals that we have already seen in our simple knowledge graph logic, and Blank's node, which I will treat in the next lecture. So I'll take them apart because they have a role of, of variables and that's slightly complicating matters. So let's start with the URIs, the uniform resource identifiers, and they talk about resources where resources could be almost anything. So they are objects, they are they can be abstract classes, they can be abstract uh, um, like, uh, like feminism, like set, the word set, the, 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 the type set, but also very concrete things like the Netherlands, Amsterdam. Um, and these are things that we want, we want to denote wherever they are described somewhere on the web. So in order to identify those resources, there is a schema uh, developed, which is called the URI, the Uniform Resource Identifier Schema, uh, where you point, these are the names that you give to the resources, whatever these resources are. So the URIs are reference to the resource, they are not the resource themselves. So that you, multiple URIs can actually denote the same resource. So there might be different URIs, uniform resource identifier that all go about, uh, about the Netherlands and they all denote the same object, the same resource. There's a new term IRI nowadays used in the specification, which is in principle the same definition as URIs, but it allows for Unicode characters. So the main point to note is that the URIs are not the objects themselves, but they are identifiers for objects. So we do not deal with objects themselves. We ha don't have an object, the Netherlands, that we treat here, but we only work with the link to this object, with the, 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 the identifier for this object. URIs do not need to be URLs. So there are other ways of uniquely identifying a resource. We have this in books, for example. So the ISBN is a very typical example for a unique identifier for a book. Geolocations are a unique identifier for a specific location, as are mail addresses. So mail to Rinke Hoekstra is an example for a unique identifier for a specific uh, resource. And there are many, many more different possibilities of doing this. There is a request, one of the principles, to make those URIs web addresses so that we can actually provide information in RDF at these web addresses to describe the objects that we want to talk about so that the resource identifiers are not only identifiers, but that they are also um, a link to getting more information about the objects. So this means that in most of the cases, we really want a, a web address, a real existing web address to be our, our, identify, our names for our identifiers so that we can follow up with an HTTP request and get the information for this, this resource. For example, HTTP, uh, DDDBpedia.org resource ne the Netherlands should get us an RDF document. So here is, if I click this, then my browser will follow an HTTP uh, request will, and it will basically give me information about the Netherlands that comes from Wikipedia but has been uh, stored here in a machine reader format. So this is RDF that is rendered for human cons consumption and it's basically a description of the data um, about the Netherlands in DBpedia which comes directly from Wikipedia. This is very useful information that you are going to use, probably all of you, in one of the projects and that we already try to, um, to query and access in this coming exercise. So this is the, um, the, the rich source uh, um, DBpedia that we can access from within our triples because we can dereference them because they are web addresses. Now, this slide is about um, how we can get rid of these tedious naming schemes uh, because uh, web addresses are 
very often very long and hard to read and write. So in many of the syntaxes and the concrete serializations of, the, of RDS, you can have an abbreviation mechanism, which is called namespaces and prefixes. So you basically define a prefix, dbpedia column, which is an abbreviation for this web address. And the same for dbo column is an abbreviation for the dbpedia ontology. And then when you use your URIs, you can have more compact URIs, basically written down as dbpedia column, and then the name of your resource, which is an abbreviation for the more complex uh, full web address. So whenever we work with real data from the web, we first define sort of the web address as a prefix, and then we can work with far more compact and readable uh, URIs for human consumption. You will see this also in the practical assignment. So now that we have URIs, we can combine URIs using properties, um, where the properties themselves can also be resources that are referenced to by URIs. So here we have an example where we have a URI that references to the object, the resource, the Netherlands, by a URI capital, which, did, which identifies a, an object capital, which is a relation in this case, and a relation and, and, and an object Amsterdam um, that is referenced by the DBpedia description of it. So this is now information that we can give about Amsterdam and the Netherlands, that they are related by a capital relation. It's exactly the same as we've seen previously in the previous module, where we identified um, information that we could specify as triples. We can write down the same thing, however, now by using these prefixes, by saying, okay, we, we know that dbpedia.org.resource is a common term, so we abbreviate it into dbpedia column, the Netherlands. The same holds for the ontology, um, so that we can use the DBO abbreviation and dbpedia uh, column for Amsterdam, again, the database dbpedia as an abbreviation. So now, if we want to give a total area for Amsterdam, then we could refer to an object of this number, but that would probably not be a good idea because then we would need for every number, we would need a separate, um, a separate object. And this is not scalable and is not, not useful from a modeling perspective. That's why, apart from the URIs that describe objects, we can also um, have literals which describe concrete domains such as integers, decimal numbers and strings and so forth. So the second ingredient of, your, uh, of RDF, of the, the, the triples, can be literals. So let's see how this works. So a literal um, is a, a data type that um, is used for literal data values. It comes with a data su type such as string or integer or float or whatever. Um, they are also resources. And they are also referenced via URIs, but they have now a special uh, meaning that can be attach, uh, attached to using the XML uh, um, schema information, um, which, for example, says that this number is of a specific SSD type double. Um, if we do not assign a specific data type, then the data type is assumed automatically to be of type string, XSD string type. So here we don't give the explicit type because we believe or we, we assume that it is a string. And then basically we can add information about uh, what kind of language the string is in by having data tags, which is very useful if you want to have, for example, all uh, the information that is about the Den Haag in given in the Netherlands in, in Dutch um, or in English um, um, in practice. It's a very useful tag. It's a very useful information about the strings and the literals in general. So now that we have the ingredients for forming the triples, we can form graphs. So we've seen that we have a triple dbpedia the Netherlands is related with dbpedia Amsterdam by a DBO capital relation. And we know that DBPD Amsterdam 
is related with a string Amsterdam by the DBP, the DBP, the ontology official name relation string Amsterdam. Um, so if we now add these two triples together, then we get a graph. Is this graph down here? So we have a description of DBP the Amsterdam. It has an official name, which is a string Amsterdam, and it is the capital of the Netherlands. So basically, it's very often that you see this directed labeled graph representation for RDF triples, um, and uh, an RDF knowledge base is therefore also uh, called an RDF knowledge graph or an RDF graph or an RDF knowledge graph. In practice, you can also uh, give names to graphs, which makes this the, the pure graph metaphor um, uh, slightly more difficult to, 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 to formalize in mathematical terms, because then you get um, hypergraphs and multigraphs and so forth. So that's uh, um, far more difficult. But in our simple case, we don't name our graphs. So a graph is simply a set of triples. So this is what um, uh, Tim asked us to do in his vision, use URIs as names for things. The URIs were the unique resource identifiers, which are names for the links to the things on the web. Um, and if you use URIs that can be understood by HTTP, then we can get, get additional information about these things that we reference within URI, and that's very useful as well. And finally, when someone looks up a URI, it is great if there is useful information provided by this. So what I did when I clicked on the uh, DBpedia Amsterdam, I think it was, then I got a website that contained RDF that I could read with the information um, about this resource and with which a machine could now also do very interesting things. And that was probably too fast, but um, you'll see it later, that in many of those um, uh, documents, there are URIs, which again link to other data sets. So in DBpedia, you have data sets, you have links to data sets in, um, uh, from medical domains or from geographic domains or other vocabularies. Um, and that really allows us to build a web of data in RDF. So let's uh, quickly go back to the question of why the, the, the HTTP arise, uh, because they have a global space and they are unique throughout the web. So there are no two URIs, um, if they are web addresses, HTTP URIs, then there are no um, two addresses that, that give you two different, um, 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 two different objects. So if you have, sorry, there is no one uh, URI that get, gives you two different objects on the web. So there's always one object. So in principle, they fulfill the, the role of the keys in the relational database, um, which have to be unique within a table. Um, and that helps us to uh, avoid name clashes um, so that if you look for, a, for an object, category, item one, two, three, you know exactly where you land. And in many cases, you can describe them in normal terms, which also makes them grounded in society because there needs to be something on the other side of the URI, on the receiving end of this identifier. And there are also addresses, which helps us to do browsing. So we can follow the links. We can follow our nose when we get URI, we click on it, we get information uh, as I showed you, and we could have clicked on other of those uh, uh, URIs in this document to get more information. And by this way, we can track, track the data that is in, the, in, in triples by just following the resource identifiers that have been specified in these triples. Why triples? Obviously, I made the case uh, last week in the last module about knowledge graphs, why they were useful and why they were um, uh, very important. And one thing is that uh, any information format that we normally see or uh, that was that, that were still dominant as well, tabular things, uh, um, trees, rows, uh, columns and so forth, they can all be transformed in triples. So the database that we saw last week 
um, we have a, a, a maybe even richer representation if we use a, a knowledge graph and if we use RDF even more because now we can link the, the, the elements in this knowledge graph to other objects on the web. And it really means that the, all the relationships that we have in the database columns, uh, that we have now made them explicit. Because something I didn't say that, that explicitly maybe, also the properties in our triples are resources themselves. So we can again now specify properties of these properties. And that makes it very rich. Um, the predicate itself is an element in the triple and can be described in RDF. So in a way, this really gives the information about the meaning of the database uh, now as a self-documenting property. So we can describe what a database means by including this information to the database. And that makes it very easy to reuse this database because the information about the schema is available in the graph very often by itself. Oh, why graphs? Graphs are highly versatile formats. They are very simple. Uh, everything is the same. So you have no worries in terms of parsing or so. You don't need to, to loop over complicated lists. You know there are three elements. The first one is the subject. The second one is the predicate. The third one is the object. And this is very easy to manipulate as well. So graph are just sets of triples so we can use basic set operations um, such as the ones that are automatically uh, come with python uh, you can just see a graph as a set and then you can just set check for uh, um, uh, subclass relations for um, entailment or you can set check for uh, whether a triple is an element of a set and this is just comes for free because it's basic set operations that are, we apply if you want to merge two RDF graphs, you just take the union. If you have two tabular data, then you really need to match the, the, the dimensions, the table dimensions. And in a tree, you, you can only um, um, have, have uh, you're very restricted by the input that you have because you can only have one parent. And if you want to extend an RDF graph, just add more triples. And that's not so easy if you want to add arbitrary data to, to a relational database, you really need to know the, 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 the schema and you need to, to stick to the schema. Or if you have an XML document, you need to restructure the XML schema. And that is really one of the advantages of this very simple data model of a knowledge graph.